Right. Uh, my topic for um, this morning is, as Chris just said, profligate generosity in the perception of Christ, of Francis, and Claire, and de Bonaventure. But one could easily make an assertion about everybody, all of the Franciscans, I think. Uh, it's something that uh, it's one of those golden threads, as Chris was describing in various ways, that, that runs through Franciscan perceptions for the last 800 years. The method of my delivery, I should have said this in the very beginning, is um, I'm going to work off notes uh, for two reasons. One is I haven't written up the paper yet. And uh, the other reason is, is because for ease of delivery, it's a very, very broad subject. And if I had to read a paper to you, um, I'd run out of time. So it's much easier to do it this way and hopefully more enjoyable for you. So where I'd like to begin is by defining some terms. Don't touch that, whatever it was. One can do theology, of which Christology is an aspect, in two ways. One we might call theory, which leads to doctrine. And it's usually done in a rational, systematic way, and it's a product often of the schools, but not necessarily. And certainly when we meet uh, St. Bonaventure, I think he would qualify as, as, as that kind of theologian. One can also des describe these sorts of insights, however, in terms of what we may call spirituality, which will lead to what we call praxis, which is doing something, and is, generally speaking, devotional and intuitive. Francis would certainly fit into that mode. He's not a, a trained theologian. Claire would fit into that mode, too, although her Latin clearly is better than Francis, so she probably had a slightly better education. But still, I think both of them would be masters of the spiritual life, not that Bonaventure wasn't. And that leads me to my second point, just by way of background, which is it's dangerous to completely separate the, the two. They need to be separated so we understand what we're talking about. But if we separate the two fundamentally, I think each becomes poorer. And so I'd like to kind of anecdotally make this point, which is deadly to do since we're filming this thing, but uh, to, by telling you a story. Anybody who knows me and has heard my homilies, as Chris said, or whatever, you know, the classroom, knows that I love to tell stories. Uh, many, many years ago, I was living way up in the mountains in a rural part of uh, America. Uh, it was a small community of brothers. And a brother who wasn't part of our community came to spend some time with us. He wanted to do a retreat because it was a beautiful area. We lived out in the forest. There was a lot of snow, though, at that when he was there. I think he was there about a week. And so we were all kind of cooped up in the house, get, getting seriously on one another's nerves. And I remember I'd just about had it with this guy. This is why it's dangerous to tell this to a camera. Um, and he was, he was completely unaware of that, though. So he was sitting there jabbering away. And I just went, go away. And he said, he said something I will never, ever forget, mainly because I, I lost my temper. And he said, uh, he said, I just want you to know, Tom, that I'm not into doctrine. Oh, really? You're a friar, but you're not into doctrine. He says, no, I'm into praxis, just praxis, act, that's all. I lost it. <laughs> I said, then how do you manage to put a spoon in your mouth when you're eating your cereal in the morning instead of your eye? Do you plan on going anywhere when you put one foot in front of the other? You can't act without thinking. And so spirituality will always inform theology, and theology will inform spirituality. But we need to recognize that they're two different things. And the emphasis that I want to make is on praxis, because that's where Franciscans seem to generally start, with doing something, with perceiving something. And then that teaches them about the theory. So they move from the concrete to the abstract instead of the other way around. Now, I know this is not absolutely 100% true of every Franciscan theologian, but it's a pattern that I've noticed, at least in my own studies. So let's begin with uh, Francis of Assisi himself. We have three uh, Franciscan thinkers that I want to discuss today. One is Francis, one is Claire, and one is Saint Bonaventure. Francis of Assisi is definitely what we might call Christocentric. He perceives the world through the lens of his relationship with Jesus. And definitely, as I've already said, he is an intuitive. Where he begins, and where I wanted to kind of describe with, with uh, three bullet points, is by asking the famous teleological questions of source and destination. One being, why are we here? Two being, or sorry, one being, 
Yeah, why are we here? Why did I repeat that? <laughs> Uh-oh. Oh, I see why I did it. Two being, uh, where are we going? And uh, three being, no, oh, that's wrong, sorry. Why are we here? <laughs> I wrote, why are we here twice. See, I, I, when I was, that'll teach me to not, to, to work off of notes instead of a paper. Okay, why are we here is first. Okay, then we need to know how we're at accomplishing that. And finally, we need to know where it is that we need to be ultimately. Let's just put it that way. The answers to those questions are going to be our first glimpse at, this God, at a God who completely pours himself out in terms of gift. This is personal, this is affective, and the answers go like this. We are here by a holy act of God's love. The journey is accomplished by sharing divine life and being co-lovers of the world along with God. And the ultimate result is we are destined for the same glory that Christ was destined for. This is the reason why we're in this world, and it's the reason why we make the journey, and it is the end of the journey itself. To put it in simple English, everything that we experience from beginning to end is understood by Francis to be a gift from God, something that is given generously. Being, grace, and glory. That sums up our journey, at least in the way that God intended us to make it. And so within that journey, the experience of those three fundamental aspects of gift, Francis journeys with a companion, Christ, who teaches him about the triune God. But I want to list four more characteristics of that companionship with Christ. First, it's a tangible companionship. Remember, this is a man who is into praxis. He, he learns from his experience. And so his experience of Christ is absolutely tangible. And that leads to the next one directly, which is something I coined myself, so take it with a grain of salt. And that is his experience of Christ is radically existential. The, the term I like to give it, I realize it sounds a bit highfalutin, is uh, exis he's an existential mystic. But what that means is crucial because in his encounter, with this tangible, loving Christ, so tangible that the figure of on the crucifix literally speaks to him, words of love, words of recognition. So tangible is that experience that Christ becomes literally present to him, literally every step along the way. I'll give you examples of this uh, in just a minute, but for now, keep that in mind. Christ isn't simply a distant figure from history, from the first century AD, nor is he some kind of distant figure in the sense of being seated at the right hand of the Father, as we just celebrated the Ascension the other day. Nor is he distant in a future sense, like how many years is he going to wait till he comes back again? No, on the contrary, Christ has made himself into a 13th century companion, and he remains so for us today, presumably, as a 21st century companion. Thus, the tangibility and the existential, the immediacy of that encounter, that loving encounter, is absolutely fundamental for Francis. It also, though, is contextualized in point three, or C, which is that it's biblical. He meets the historical Jesus, the Jesus of the Gospels, not simply of abstract theory or even of the book of Revelation, say, or Daniel, but the mendicant pilgrim, the preacher of the good news, the poor man of Nazareth, and finally, I already mentioned the word intuitive, but his intuition has a very, very important characteristic, which is to say it is, speaks the language of the heart. The technical term that we use is it is affective. Francis' entire encounter with Christ and through Christ, with God, of course, is going to be, be uh, expressed in those terms. That affective language is part and parcel of his story. And so, to kind of conclude with Francis, because we don't have a whole lot of time here, is I would like to give you some examples from his writings. The first is, is one that I only recently learned. I was teaching a course um, at the Franciscan International Studies Center on um, 
It wasn't Franciscan sources. It was uh, Franciscan spirituality within the sources. And uh, what came out loud and clear in the Francis's testament, I don't know if you're familiar with Franciscan literature, but his testament is, is an incredibly short, but very, very succinct autobiography, really. I think it's only about two or three pages long, where he tells his own story. And the, in the very, very first paragraph of the testament, he recounts the story of his own conversion. And what leapt out of the page was this. In fact, he almost says it quite literally, although I'm going to paraphrase here. He says, I was not able to show anybody mercy until God showed mercy to me. I'd never caught that before. His experience of the generosity of God in showing him mercy is the one who made him so full of mercy that instead of running away from a leper, he runs towards him and gives him a big embrace. But that's my second example. Thomas of Chilano, whom Chris just mentioned, wrote two accounts of Francis's life. In one account, Francis runs up to a leper, who I like to call Bob, surprises him, probably the biggest shock of, of this poor leper's life, because he's used to being treated as a pariah by everybody. In fact, he, legally, he is a pariah. Francis runs up to him, gives him this giant embrace, and kisses him on his lipless face. This happens to be the crucified savior, all right? The poorest, least powerful person in Europe, if you will, all right? And there's the paradox. So what makes him so handsome, so powerful, and so rich? He died on a cross. He was laid in a manger. He was rejected by his own people, on and on and on and on. One thing leads to another, and she invites Agnes to her own guided meditation. And here's how it goes. She says, I want you to contemplate the crucifix hanging on the wall. Now, everybody would have had a crucifix hanging on their wall, and this is before the Reformation, so there's no, there's no crosses without corpuses, all right? They've all got a corpus, except this one doesn't, or does it? Instead of a corpus, there's a mirror, a mirror hanging in the middle of the cross. She says, contemplate that image. Whose image? There's no corpus, it's a mirror. Agnes looks in the mirror, what does she see? She sees herself. But it isn't her, per se, it's the corpus. Claire is going the next step that Francis went when he encountered the leper. Let me put it to you in personal terms. It's easy, in a way, to love a leper, but have you ever tried loving yourself? That's the hard one. Have you ever looked at yourself in the bathroom mirror in the morning and just thought to yourself, God, you are so lovable. <laughs> I'll bet you haven't done it recently. But the fact of the matter is, you are. And so what Agnes is invited to contemplate is her own image, which has become Christ's image. Christ is that close to her, that loving, that he actually became like her. And she is invited then, in doing so, to become like him. There's the divine generosity, once again, understood in Claire's terms, as she invites Agnes to a penitential life, a barefoot life, away from royal palaces and all the toys she could ever want, to live that kind of life. And she's saying, don't shed a tear. You, have, you are making yourself unbelievably rich and you are marrying the most powerful, handsome, richest man in Europe, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The paradox, once again, of a God who is fundamentally generous. But the best for last, my favorite at least, St. Bonaventure. Now, St. Bonaventure is a man of the schools, but that doesn't mean he's not a mystic, and it certainly doesn't mean that he's not motivated by a spirituality particularly after a retreat that he does at the place where Francis received the stigmata. He is imbued with that mysticism of the man of the cross and of the Pavarello, and he tries to plumb that mystery. But we're going to look at it in his terms. And what I want to do is just to very briefly, because Bonaventure is complicated, to uh, very briefly kind of take a, a, cosmo, a cosmic approach to this rather than the personal one that uh, Francis and Claire did. 
Bonaventure espouses an ancient, ancient Christian view of creation and reality, which would have been common to just about everybody in his, uh, certainly in his period and almost certainly before that, which is based on Platon, Platonist uh, philosophy. Which, and it goes by various names, but the one I'm going to give it here is emanation and return. And what it means is that everything comes from its source. We can understand that as God, and everything's going to go back to its source, thus emanation and return. But Bonaventure is a Franciscan, and so Bonaventure is going to change that and put his own stamp of originality on it. And here's how he does it. He has recourse to a non-Franciscan. In fact, the man lived 100 years before him, roughly, named Richard of St. Victor, another great mystic. Richard of St. Victor wrote a very, very famous book. In fact, you can read it in English. It's put in the uh, Classics of Western Spirituality series on Richard of St. Vic Victor. And it's called De Trinitatis. It's a proof of God's triune existence, not God's existence, but his triune existence based on a proof text. So faith is still needed. It's not, it's not um, avoiding faith. It's basically based on a proof text. In this case, the proof text is uh, from the Johannine um, epistle, God is love. What Richard says, and I've got to figure out a way to make this really succinct here, what Richard says is that if indeed God is love, then God obviously needs an object to love. Love does not exist in a vacuum. The lover needs a beloved, the beloved needs a lover, and vice versa. And if all there is is God, fundamentally, then what God is going to love is himself. And there's nothing wrong with that or unnatural. In fact, it's the most natural, perfect thing that there is. And in loving himself, he pictures himself, so to speak. And in picturing himself, he speaks that word which is himself. And because he is being itself, that word is also being. And we have the eternal generation of the second person of the Trinity. But it's not just a word. That word is, I love you. That's the word that God spoke, which generated the Son. And the Son speaking that word back, I love you too. Because remember, it's the same being, love for love. That word spoken back is the spiration of the Spirit, and we have a triune God. Now, I've just done terrible injustice to Richard's proof, but <laughs> it's all the time we have for it. Richard will coin a phrase then, which Bonaventure will, will take over, lock, stock, and barrel. Bonaventure read Richard. And the phrase is this, that God can be understood then in his triune existence as self-diffusive good. Substitute the word good, self-diffusive love. It's the same thing. Love is self-diffusive. It, it's what it does. This is how Bonaventure then understands emanation not in some kind of cold, abstract way of Middle Platonism, but in a very, very personal way. God's love was in, is infinite. He loves himself infinitely in his, tri, in, his, in, his, in his triune existence, and then it overspills, so to speak, into creation. And so you and I, and the stars in the sky, and those, all of those blades of grass out on the lawn, were all created for the same reason as objects for God to love. That's how Bonaventure understands emanation. And the return is simply the journey, I suppose, back towards that state of union, which is fundamentally expressed in scripture, either as um, uh, conjugal uh, relationships between a man and a woman or uh, eating. We, of course, experience that in Eucharist. And again, can you bear being away from the one that you love with all of your hearts? And the answer, of course, is no. You want to be with them. And so you return. Emanation return understood in a personal, affective way, because God is understood as one who is simply a profligate lover. And so the entire world is then reoriented to its source through the incarnation of that very same word, which was the hand that made it. That word, which made the world through love, then reintroduces it to its meaning. And Jesus stands in Bonaventure's word, and I love this, it's one of Bonaventure's most famous terms, in medias res, in the center of all things. And in doing so, all things find their frame of reference once again to him. But he, he stands there as an example, so to speak, exemplar, although it's more than an example, as one who reorientates the world to its proper function, which is to say, 
The greater will serve the lesser, because that's what love does. The greater will pour itself out generously. The rich become poor, so that the poor can become rich, and then they in turn become poor, on and on and on, as the world is reoriented towards proper relationship, which is proper service. That's where Bonaventure will take his schema, so to speak, of Christ as that revelation of the profligate love of God. Now, I promised that I was going to end a little bit early so we could have another break before the next talk. And we have questions for later, but um, let me just check and make sure I didn't miss anything. Let me end it with this. In Scripture, I just want to, I, I want to ground this in Scripture now, all three of our thinkers, Francis, Claire, and Bonaventure. For me, the, the ultimate uh, Scripture, now we, we've looked at uh, Christ washing the disciples' feet in terms of service, in terms of the greater seeking out the lesser. And Jesus, by the way, says this is what God does. It's not condescension. He's not coming out of his place. He's not playing Halloween or voyeuristic tourist. He's saying to them in that room, if you want to be like God, do this. Read it yourself. It's very clear. We've seen Richard's text, God is love. Well, what does love do? Let's look at one more. And this really is my favorite. And you'll be instantly familiar with it. It is uh, Philippians 2, the canticle in Philippians, where Paul says very, very poetically, in fact, they say that really he's, he's, it's a hymn, that even though Jesus existed in the form of Almighty God, filled with everything that could possibly be and more, the heir of, of eternal riches, he does not grasp it, but rather empties himself out. He uses that word, that canonic word, that libation word, which implies sacrifice and generosity at the same time. He says, he poured himself out, and he went as far as he could go as liquid will. I've never seen liquid run uphill, only down. And so he becomes a human being, which if your God is a, a big come down, but not just a human being, he becomes a slave. And I really don't like the new translations where they call him a servant and all that kind of business. No, the word is slave. And who wants to be a slave? Nobody. But not just a slave, a dead one. The final place, the lowest place, where that divine pouring out really reaches a stage which is profligate, is the cross. And it's a literal pouring out, of course, of blood. This is the great text, but it's not the end. And I want to share an insight with you, and if you disagree, that's perfectly okay, because, um, again, this is, this is my own. I was, in fact, I'm going to make a tiny little story of this. I was sitting in, a, in the presider's chair at Mass one day. This was um, in America this many, many years ago. And this reading will come up a few times in the liturgical year, and it was one of those times. And I, I, I just heard this word that had escaped me all through all of the millions of times that I'd heard that reading, and the word was therefore, or it's sometimes translated as because. Now, I've checked it to the Latin. I don't know Greek, but I've checked it to the Latin, and that's the word, all right? And here's how it goes. Jesus pours himself out, I should say, the Logos, the second person of the Trinity, pours himself out in the incarnation. He finds the lowest place, and yet oceans of ink have been spilled, erroneously, I believe, making it look as if he came away from his proper place to an improper place, the cross, in order to somehow make things okay for us. I would propose to you that that's true, that he, that he made things okay for us, but the way he did it was to show us what the proper place actually is. And the proper place is the lowest place. The word then, once he's down there, is because of that, Therefore, God exalted him and raised him up, and every knee bent and every tongue proclaimed that Jesus Christ is Lord. In simple English, what I believe Francis' insight would validate, as well as the other Franciscans I've discussed with you, is that the highest place and the lowest place become fused. I realize we enter into the realm of paradox, but there's no other way because we're talking about the reconstitution of the world that God intended, and it is not the world that we live in today. We're getting there, perhaps, but we're not there yet. And so we have to encounter this paradox. We have to face it. We're the highest place. It remains the highest place, but it is found down here, not up here. 
And that's why Francis is able to call himself a knight of the round table. He's able to refer to the cross as a royal throne. It's a way Claire is able to say to Agnes of Prague, oh yes, you're going to marry a king, a very, very powerful man, a very rich man, because they know perfectly well that that's all true. My favorite examples of all, and I will leave you with this, are given by, who else? Lady Poverty. But is she uh, a wizened, sour old thing? <laughs> never, 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 never. The two examples I give you are these. Both taken from the Sacrum Commercial, if you want your source. The brothers are on a picnic with her, and they're having this conversation, uh, reminiscing about oh, all sorts of things. And she, rather tongue-in-cheek, says to them, uh, show me, you know, your, 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 your priceless crockery, you know, your, your um, Royal Crown Derby teacups and all that kind of business. And they, they, they hold up this, this cracked, lopsided mug, you know, that they're using, full of spring water. And they say, what do you think? And she goes, lovely, just lovely. I think this goes on and on for quite a while. Finally, she gets up. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to Umbria, where um, they're from, one of the most beautiful landscapes in the world, and they're on a hilltop. She stands up and she, she, she says, where's your cloister? Where's your cloister with all the gold and the glinting jewels and carvings? Now, this is a dig at the Cluniac monks. By the way, their feast was yesterday, and I, I told some funny stories about them to a group of Benedictine nuns. Risked my life. <laughs> but, uh, and the brother, one of the brothers stands up, and he points to this exquisite horizon, all right, of landscape. And he says, this is our cloister. Now, it's a no-brainer, don't you think? Which would you prefer, the planet Earth or a stuffy old monastery? I'll take planet Earth if I had a choice. But the best for last, and then I'm through. Also, the Sacrum Commercium. And this, 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 this one's edgy. She says, this is, this is where Lady Poverty is doing some reminiscing. And she says, do you know that uh, I was with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? Now, I don't know what they had to say about it, but I'm thinking to myself, what in the world is Lady Poverty doing in the Garden of Eden? You know, she belongs, you know, in, in a slum somewhere. She says, yeah, I was in the Garden of Eden with uh, Adam and Eve. And you know what we did? We played all day long. Never had to do any work. We just played. There's those empty hands. There's that party I threw. She said, well, eventually they had to leave. We know why. And we parted company. Haven't seen them since. What? I thought they became poor when they left. No. Well, yes, they did. But they didn't think they were poor. They left clutching a big, fat, useless diamond. And Lady Poverty wept until she met Francis, her son, who understood that she is the allegorical personification of that God who simply gives and gives and gives. Thank you very much.